definitely a difference between American and British senses of humour. We laugh at, we laugh at stuff in America. And my dad, when I was a kid, my dad used to say, oh, Americans, they laugh at anything. A bit more in your face, a bit more uh, loud. American tends to be a little bit more blunt, a little bit to more to the point. They tend to be more smart, Alec. They tend to be more wise guys. It's, it's live, you know, it's like it's live, it's kind of, it's happening, it's, it's muscular, it's kind of, it's big, it's confident. Whereas I think in Britain, we tend to be a lot more dry. We tend to be a lot more sarcastic. Britain, we're all squashed in this mouldy little overcrowded island. In England, people tend to laugh at themselves. Um, we have to laugh at everything. America's still very enclosed and they're not willing to go to the touchy subjects that British comedies. Although Britain and America are two countries on completely different sides of the planet, they're unified by their culture. From politics to music to the language we speak, they seem to have a very special connection. But two different cultures breed two completely different senses of humour. In this documentary, we explore what makes them similar, but also what separates them. The difference between a British and American protagonist, I think that uh, the American protagonist tends to be kind of the hero, the macho guy, the guy that every guy wants to be, if we're talking about a man, by the way. Um, whereas with a, a British protagonist tends to kind of be a loser. Like I'm, I have in mind that show, uh, Peep Show. How old are these? I don't know, they're always good. Eggs, aren't they? Till they hatch. Are they? Yeah. You know what, maybe it's fine. Is it Moroccan? Maybe it is Moroccan. The protagonist from that, he's, he's a, bit of a, a bit of a loser, isn't he? He's kind of like, he always is the loser. He's always the, the sad guy. Let's take... 40 Towers. Basil is a buffoon. He doesn't see himself the other season. He, he, he's not funny. The people, the characters around him, they don't laugh at, you know, along with him. The American show Seinfeld, which is one of my favorites, uh, the loser guy is kind of like the comedy foil. He's, the, he's not the protagonist. The protagonist is Jerry, who, who gets loads of girls, and he's got a great job, and he's funny, and he's cool. And then there's his friend George, who's kind of a loser. That guy in English comedy tends to be the protagonist, the main man. Whereas in Friends, everybody gets to be a wisecracking guy, you know, and a, and a lot of the, uh, and in MASH, there are a lot of wisecracking smart guys. Um, similarly in The Office, even though he attempts humor, the character of David Bren isn't perceived as funny by the people around him. He's a buffoon. He doesn't see, they don't see their own deficiencies. That I think is the, is the kind of, the main uh, point, and I think um, American humor is more jokers. You get people cracking jokes, one-liners, uh, and smart and savvy, and it's pacey. Whereas British, uh, the British sense of humor, I'm talking about sitcoms, I'm thinking of Steptoe, Forty Towers, Rising Dab, The Office. The approach, the point of access is a point of reality. I think that's the difference. The lead guy, you're supposed to be that's you, that represents you, doesn't it, as, as a viewer. So you, so you have to identify with them. So in Britain, we're the underdog, I think. In America, maybe a bit more the, the hero, but then you look at stuff like recent American stuff. I mean, again, The Office, you know, he's the, the idiot underdog again, and he's, you're kind of on his side, and you're kind of not. So I don't know, maybe they're similar these days. There were perhaps no more two opposing comedic styles than Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton. Buster Keaton, the straight-faced cool guy, and Charlie Chaplin, the lovable idiot. Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton both had quite different styles. So Buster tended to be uh, a little bit more deadpan, straight-faced, whereas Charlie Chaplin tended to be a little bit more colourful. And there's been some quite unique differences between them. I mean, Buster was considered the better filmmaker by many people, whereas Charlie Chaplin was considered a better writer. Um, so. They probably did take certain aspects from each other, but they stylistically were quite different. But they were both sort of on the cutting edge at the same time, which makes them interesting. They're both quite different people, but both at the forefront of what they were doing. Your big stars had their own shtick, had their own, do you know what I mean by shtick? Like their own kind of little bit of personal comedy where, where they always knew they could get a laugh from, like, like the guy Chris Farley. I don't know if you know who Chris Farley is. Um, 
Chris Farley was an actor on Saturday Night Live, and he had his characters, and the way that he would act and the way that he would move were very specific to him and very, very funny. And I guess in a way that Charlie Chaplin kind of connects to that in the way that he's a very noticeable character. And you know in his, with his little movements and the way he has his cane and the way that he walks and wears his funny mustache, and that that's his sort of shtick. In 1946, Pinwright's Progress was the first half an hour sitcom to air on television. However, it was American comedies such as I Love Lucy and the Jack Benny program that would influence the conventions of modern sitcom as we know it. You can see this in the simple dining room setting and the filming technique known as the three-headed monster. I Love Lucy is really significant because it's seen as kind of inventing the look of sitcom, the way in which it's shot and the way in which it's edited, and in particular the focus on the reaction shot, the idea that um, when somebody tells a joke, you will get laughs, but if you then cut to somebody reacting to a joke, you can get another laugh just by that reaction. Um, and that shooting style is still the standard one in sitcom. You, you see it in Big Bang Theory, you see it in pretty much every sitcom. And certainly, if you look at it stylistically, with the way this, they had that open plan set, characters coming in left and right from behind and behind the sofa, um, that's effectively the same set as Friends. She shouts all the time, um, and this, to me, seems to be significant here here is a woman in the the, the early 50s who is absolutely dominating a television screen and i think for that alone it's landmark but also she's tremendously funny i actually find it hard to think about um anybody that's actually more more funny than lucille ball and it's all about what happens in the house all about the domestic I think that although the British sitcoms, uh, they are different, they, they, the Amer in terms of situation comedy for television, uh, America led the way and um, the first uh, really, I mean the comedy initially in, in, in England, it was really, uh, they hadn't really worked it out if you know what I mean, what they had were variety acts doing their routines um, in a TV studio. Uh, or they would do historical drums, which they still do to this day. They hadn't really worked on sitcoms. Um, and then they kind of noticed across the Atlantic that the Americans were doing sitcoms. There's a debate in, uh, over whether, you know, the sitcom is an American invention or a British invention. Um, because in Britain, it's normally traced back to radio. So you had a, a load of kind of radio and comedies that, that were sketch shows and then slowly developed into to longer sketches that developed into sitcom. But the, the television idea of, of sitcom certainly comes from America, with you say something like uh, Jack Benny, um, and that idea of taking a uh, famous stand-up comedian and giving them their own programme and, and, and building a programme around and the comic personality of an individual, that's an American idea. So that, and that comes out of vaudeville. Um, so the history that's normally put together is that the American sitcom tradition comes out of theatre, whereas the British one comes out of radio uh, and does have earlier musical uh, antecedents. Um, but yeah, those programmes were around before British sitcom was, was doing anything, any good, really. However, in the 1960s, satire would begin to rise in popularity, with stage shows such as Beyond the Fringe touring America to great success and television programmes such as That Was The Week That Was being massively influential. There's this saying in relation to the period of the early 60s that deference went out of fashion. People learnt not to defer so much to the, to the ruling classes and that was articulated completely in That Was The Week That Was, um, you know, which, you know, lampooned the Prime Minister and other establishment figures mercilessly. If, when it comes to politics, whenever I read up on it, especially through satirical platforms, um, I would say Britain's more liberal, um, despite what people think or say. Um, I think you can get away with a lot more, with a lot less backlash. I think it's absolutely disgusting, all these elected politicians using all these expenses to better themselves. Disgraceful, isn't it, Ian? It is absolutely disgraceful, Mr. Kettle. <laughs> uh, uh... <laughs> I think in Britain you have to be very, very careful what you say. Often 
Um, and I think the comedians that can get away with it, I've, I've spent years trying to carve out this niche audience that understands that what they're saying is a joke. Britain has maybe inspired America a bit more, but America's still very enclosed and they're not willing to go to the touchy subjects that British comedy is much more willing to. I think, Amer I, I, I think America is a country of extremes, as in there is like extreme bigotry and extreme liberal mindedness. And I think that people, like when you get your proper American audiences, I don't just mean like the people that just like sort of hack nonsense because those guys are going to be even worse than the guys that just like hack nonsense here. When you get, so you get those guys, but the extremes of those guys are the, like the comedian, the comedy audiences that are just, that will accept, accept the fact that a comedian is telling a joke and that what they're saying isn't true. And then, and because they have that license, people like Doug Stanhope, uh, you know, Joe Rogan, they, because they have that license, they can push the envelope further and further and further. They can get away with a hell of a lot more because people understand that it's just a joke. You know, and I, that's what I like. And it's funny, that's probably why I like them more. When it comes to stand-up comedy, America is often seen as the country that invented it. I think we all are influenced by stand-up from it because Americans kind of invented it. So we're all going to be kind of you know, drawn from that. Um, and also, a lot, America's more universal, so through films and stuff, we can get influenced by characters in films. My favourite comedian, I think of all time, is Chris Rock. And he's like, he's, he's the guy, he's the one, I don't know, he's like the benchmark. And it ain't all black people on welfare, shit. White people on welfare too. White people on welfare. But even I think black comedy, American black comedy, is my favourite. And uh, as, as racist as that possibly is, it's the truth. But uh, I, look, I, I don't know. I sort of, I like it. I seem to sort of. If anything, it's almost like American black comedy rings more with me than sometimes British black comedy can do, which is terrible. Because you know I've grown up here all my life. You know, my, a lot of my family are British black people. But I kind of seem to sort. Of, I don't know. I find American black comedy, it's just more, it's, it's more cut and thrust, um, it's more, it's, it's live, you know, it's like it's live, it's kind of, it's happening, it's, it's muscular, it's kind of, it's big, it's confident, and uh, even if there's no basis around the confidence, you know, it's, it's, it is that, it's, it's great, it's funny, and when you get, because I mean, there's a lot of American black comedy, there's a lot of American, there's a lot of comedy, you know, and it's easy to make people laugh, that's the thing. It's easy, it's easy to do. Anybody can make somebody laugh if they study the format hard enough. But then you get people that kind of, that will break the mold and push you into new places. People like Chris Rock, people like Richard Pryor, people like Eddie Murphy in his day, like Dave Chappelle, like these guys, I mean, like, you know, these guys are killers. You know, I love, I don't know, I love that. I just, I love the, the sheer cheek of it, that's what I like. You know, you get, American comedians coming over to England and doing shows here and I always cringe a little bit when it happens because they they like to curse and maybe I've done a bit of that on this as well. The one comedy to cross over, perhaps better than any other, was the British sketch show Monty Python. It appeared at a time when comedy was very much, it was very much more shall we say conventional, there'd be a funny man, there'd be a straight man, there'd be a, a program like a comedy where it'd be, um, I'm just trying to think of it, like say Terry and June, that, that kind of comedy where it was a husband and wife and he basically spilled the custard on his lap, sort of very sort of almost slapstick. And then you had this, this thing from Python which just broke through all that. And I think what they did, which was different, was they, they, they subverted TV conventions. Like if you watch a lot of Python, it's, it's basically taking the mickey out of the interview format. It's it's taking the mickey out of TV project pretensions, and in their own words, it's being very. A lot of it is being very very silly, and and and, and very non-linear. I mean, part of Python is very non-linear. There's no story in it. It's one sketch, another sketch. There might be themes in it, and it's and it's anarchic. And nobody had really done that before, but. You probably can trace back an awful lot of comedy to Python because of that, that format. I think Monty Python's had a, an influence more on uh, British sense humour than what it has American. I think, again, kind of with some of the 
sarcastic jokes and some of the dry jokes. I think it's, it can be lost on American audiences. If you again, if you ask an American about that comedy, they probably wouldn't pick out some of the more nuanced things. They'd probably just have the the big taglines that you would have got with a movie. So that's definitely had an effect on British comedy, but I'm not so sure it's had as much an effect on American. But some comedies don't translate over so well. Could it be perhaps due to our cultural differences or our sense of humour? I think we have an idiomatic language that maybe across the Atlantic is not understood. I, you know, I think there's lots of uh, local idioms to do with region and class as well in the language that maybe Americans just don't understand the nuances. I think a lot of it is, is comedy. You know, if you really, if you go to the roots of it, um, it is a relationship. It has to be a relationship. I mean, it's not. It's not like, say, uh, crisps where you can, you know, or Coke where you can make it in America and they like it. You can make it. Give, you can give that to the British, the Chinese, whoever they'll like it. It's cultural. So um, porridge. It's set in a British prison. It, a lot of the. A lot of the jokes were very knowing. They were, they were British jokes. I mean, I remember, this is quite a naughty joke, but there was a, one of the jokes was uh, Ronnie, uh, Ronnie Barker in his cell looking at the Sun newspaper at the time and saying, oh, there's, uh, there's a picture of Pan's people, Big Babs. I don't know what her name is. Um, and Babs, if you know, if you're British, you know, you know the Babs Lord was like the star dancer in Pan's People. If you're in America, that meant nothing. And even the word Babs, <laughs> you know, some of these words don't translate. So it's in the language. So you have to do a version that does translate. Seinfeld is a specific example. I don't think made it across because a lot of the jokes have to do with being a Jewish person or knowing what a Jewish person's like living in New York City. It's like, it's a, it's, it's a whole lifestyle thing that, I mean, I'm not Jewish. I never lived in New York, but I love the show because I know people who are Jewish and people who have lived in New York and both, you know, and it, for me that I, I can connect to that. But I guess just little cultural things that you have to know in order to get the humor. When I first moved to England, my wife, showed me a Peter K tape. She had a tape, like it was 1992. Uh, and I watched this Peter K tape, and I couldn't understand a word the guy said. And even if I could have understood a word the guy said, put the big light on. Why is that funny? I don't get it. But now I've lived here for five years. I get it. Put, put big lights on, lad. I get that, you know. That's funny. And, 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 and garlic bread and all that shit. Like, I, that's good. It's, it's, it's funny humor. But it's about living where you're living and getting the cultural references. Someone like Chris Morris is very British. Uh, Armando Iannucci, another one, very British. Um, but then John Gordillo's. No, not John Gordillo. Who's the one over... John Godella's ace. But who's the one the British gone over to America? Um, um, Sean Oliver. Oliver, yes, yes. He's he's doing well over there, isn't he? So so obviously they're getting it. So obviously there is some sort of crossover. See, Amer the American English thing. I mean, it, you can you can sum it all up because they don't they 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 are they are speaking the same language. It sounds at a first listen like the same language but it's their own version of it and when you get there it is a culturally different place they've got a, they've got better weather than us more extreme everything's more extreme so it's different here we're all sort of squashed in and then and over there they're like Arr! you know and it's sort of it's kind of different it's just just because we speak the same language we think that we're all just going to link together but we don't but actually when you go there you do you fit in and it's lovely but it does it doesn't feel like we're in england it feels like we're in a foreign country, and luckily they understand what we're saying. Because we have so many ties culturally and maybe family-wise, people come back to England to see family, to, 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 to kind of see where their roots come from. And English people go to America all the time for the sunshine. <laughs> the sunshine. I miss the sunshine. Um, I think that that, uh, that whole kind of the fact that, we, that we're so closely connected on so many levels um, makes it so that you know, we, we do have that connection. But at this moment in time, does Britain or America make better comedy? Just to say, both countries produce a lot of comedy and there's, a lot of, there's always good comedy coming out of Britain, but if I'm honest about it, um, I think at the moment 
it's America. And I think that's really down to the fact that for whatever reason, they, they invest in it. They make a lot of comedy. They spend a lot of money on their comedy. And um, at the moment in Britain, we, we do try and do comedy, but it, it's, and this is just my own personal opinion, it's personal, you know, it's, it's totally subjective, but it's hard to think of anything that Britain's doing that's, um, that's really matching what's coming out of America. And I say that as someone who, who loves British comedy, I really do, but uh, um, just trying to think about it. I mean, Outnumbered or some of the things that Andy Hamilton do, uh, you know, those ones, they're pretty good. But uh, they, the really good ones, for whatever reasons, I don't think they're getting commissioned enough. Whereas America, they, um, they put a lot of money and they put, they put a lot of uh, weight behind their, their, their TV shows. Um, most really popular American comedy films are, uh, are they, they turn into rom-coms, they turn into you know, romantic comedies where it's a bit like, it's a funny setup and funny thing happen, funny things happen, like for example, in old school or in uh, Wedding Crashers, you know, it's really, lots of funny jokes are made, funny things happen, but then at the end, it's just some guy who ends up apologizing to his girlfriend and that's kind of the end of the plot and the movie's over and they all live happily ever after where I feel like here it's more about the funniness than about making it some stupid story that, I don't give a shit about. Well, because British comedy is in a very, very difficult place at the moment. It's all, I think, because of the influx of TV, I think almost as like, since the like, like satellite, you know, since satellite became big, you know, uh, since satellite became such free view, you know, there were so many more channels, the, I think the, like, the big boys, the BBC, the ITV channel, well, they've lost the power. They've lost the power. They had, no, it was kind of one of them, like, you either watch BBC or you watch ITV. And the BBC would put maybe showing the young ones, okay? And then ITV might be showing, I don't know, something nice, you know? And they had the choice, you could either watch that or you could watch that. Those were your choices. Uh, but then, and, you know, if you were in the young ones, you could push it a bit further because you know the people are either going to be watching you or watching someone else. Now that's not the case. And it's got, everybody has got to hit that mark. All these producers, all these, you know what I mean, all these, like, Everybody, they've all got to hit the marks. All the people involved in comedy, it's a numbers game, and they they have to hit those numbers. And if they don't hit those numbers, somebody else is going to come in and hit those numbers instead. And by hitting those numbers, what it means is giving people comedy that they know, giving people formats that they know that they're like. Everybody's too scared to push the envelope because if it doesn't work, man, you crash and burn. Whereas that risk could have been taken years ago. And then I see it in America. I think it's different. Either they've either. They know about the number crunching, but then they think, well, we're just going to work harder and harder and harder and harder on it. Like, they have teams of writers on every comedy, teams. You get maybe two, you know, teams of writers. Teams of writers outdoing each other, you know. It's almost like that, you know, the fittest, survival of the fittest kind of thing. And I, I don't know, I just think stronger, it's healthier, maybe it's more competition, whatever it is, it needs to come across here.